Hello and welcome to the shed. In today's video, we're going to be making a beginner friendly rebated tray. Hope you enjoy. What I'm planning over the next few videos is we're going to do a series of basic beginner friendly builds using the basic joints of dados and rebates and grooves that we've learnt over the last few weeks. Today's one, as I said in the intro, is going to be a rebated tray. So what we're going to be doing is rebating the long stretches to form the outside of the tray and we'll nail it together. So we're going to keep it very, very basic. For today's video, I'm going to be using this 19 millimeter piece of pine for the bottom. So this is 185 millimeters wide by 300 millimeters long. So that is going to be the initial layout of this particular tray. I've got some leftover 12 millimeter material from when we made the, la the first butt jointed box. We're going to cut off some 40 millimeter strips. I'm also just going to leave a little list up here of the tools. I know I've talked through a lot of them in a lot of the videos. Guys can stop the video and see what it is that I'm using in this particular video. So in order to mark this out as usual, I'm just going to come in with a ruler. A ruler like this, it's actually got etched ridges on it. It makes it a lot easier because you can just come along and drop the cutter straight into the little cut ridge on your ruler. And it means you're going to be very accurate. So accurate that I don't even need to double check that. So let's jump down in here. I'll bring you in and we'll quickly wrap a line around this board and get to rip cutting it in the uh, vise. This piece was already a dressed piece. So I, I have double checked it. Both edges are square to the sides and both sides are actually square to each face. So it was a four dress board and it is square enough for us to do what we want to. So I'm going to come through and mark straight off this face. Obviously, usual technique is to go with a lighter pass and then a couple of harder passes. In this super soft pine like this, you can almost get away with only just doing two passes, sometimes just one pass. But I like to do two passes so it doesn't move when you're going long grain like this. So we can see that I'm just going to wrap this line all the way around. It doesn't have to be particularly deep because it's just a reference for us to saw next to. We won't saw right on top of it, we'll saw just next to it so we've got a little bit of play. And because I'm going to do two strips and I know that both sides of this timber is actually square, I can actually just run a marking line off the other side. just to simplify this process a little bit. It's good to have a nice sharp pencil. If you're just using a conventional pencil like this, this sharpie, extra pointy, it gives you a very, very sharp point on your pencil, as you can see here. And that allows you to slot it straight in and follow marking gauge and knife lines. So it just makes it that much easier for you to pencil in on top of it so you can see your line. Today I'm just going to be using a standard western panel saw. Uh, I prefer these for rip cutting. I find they're easier to control and they don't travel around as much because they've got a slightly thicker plate. They travel a lot easier than say something like a Japanese Dazuki saw for rip cutting. As usual when I'm rip cutting a board like this I like to get it in the vise and get it as upright as possible just makes it that much easier to concentrate on your line and not have to worry about the alignment. If you're struggling with doing rip cutting, I will leave my link down below to the video where I uh, went through how to rip cut straight. And I'll also leave the one down below where I tell you how to correct a wayward cut. Because if you're doing some of this for the first time and you don't have a lot of experience, those two videos will help you out a lot. So we're obviously going to start here and I'm trying to get as close to my line as I can here. So, with, without actually going over it. So I'm going to come about two millimeters off that line. Sorry for that vibration. I just need to slide this across in my vise a little bit so it doesn't wobble. So you just want to listen to the sound of that. I could hear that it was moving. That's why it was making that large vibration sound. So what I've got here is I've got my board down quite low in the vise. Enough that I can get a bit of a start but not too high that it's going to vibrate and wobble the board. <laughs> so I'm going to set that like this. Now I'm looking here, it's moving a little bit off on this side, so what I'm going to do 
is rotate the board around to my side and that way I can now control where the line's going on this side because I already know that this one's tracking roughly where I want it but this side is being problematic which means my saw was probably angled slightly. So I'm going to come in this side and I'm going to try and just nibble it back to the line a little bit on this side. I'm just using the side of the saw teeth to actually bring it just across a little bit. Now I'm going to do a few passes like I have here and just keep double checking this side. So now we're tracking right on this side and we're tracking correct on my side. So what I'm going to do is lift it up and I'm going to stay sawing on my side. As long as this is going to stay where I want it, I don't need to rotate it again. So you want to just regularly check this. Still right next to that line. So what I'm now going to do is just rotate this back to my side. So as I'm doing this, I'm holding the top because we're starting to get a lot of material out of the vise. I'm using my hand up here and I'm holding across where the cut is to try and stop that wobbling back and forth like this, increasing the chance of it breaking. So I've got my hand here, which is also pulling back against it and supporting against the stroke of the saw to stop it uh, wanting to move. And as we get to the bottom here, we haven't got much left to go, about two inches here, or about 50 odd mil, maybe a little bit more than that. Now there are a couple of ways, you can hang it off the side of your vise, chop through it, you can turn the board over and bring it in and saw from the other end. Or what I like to do, is I'm just going to rock the angle of this board out like this, and then we're already establishing the curve as long as we're in the right spot we can gently go like this and we can just nibble through like that now this is not something that I've shown in other videos I've started to do this more recently because it's a little bit easier and I found it easier than hanging out off the side of your vice and because you've already got a fairly established curve there, there's not much chance of your saw travelling, so you don't have to worry about your alignment quite so much, just the sawing action. As long as you've got it relatively straight for most of it, it's just going to travel that last little bit, no problems. So now we're done that, we're actually left with three pieces. Now, for today's project, I'm likely only going to need two of these pieces, so what we're going to do is go through getting this edge as a dressed edge to the rest of the edges so we can go ahead and use it for the project. To do this I'm going to be using shooting board. You can use the long grain shooting board that I built in a previous video um, and I'll leave that link down below if you haven't built that. Or for what I'm going to show you here is so we're going to go a little more old school and use our workbench as a reference to square that edge. So what I've got happening here is that I've grabbed my shooting plane. Now it doesn't have to be a specialist shooting plane like this. I've explained a number of times why I have this one. But whatever plane you use on your shooting board, go ahead and grab that. Now to shoot square the edge on the long grain of a board like this, we don't actually need a stop at the top end other than to stop your piece from moving while you're planing it. And you don't need to have this edge squared reference to this because if that edge is already flat and was already square to that, it's not actually going to matter. So all you really need is a piece of wood that's flat underneath that's going to elevate your workpiece up off your bench. So we need to elevate it like this. And now I'm just using my bench hook here as a stop. So I've got that pushed up against it. Now you want to make sure that you've got no dust in the way and you can hold your piece, push it up against your stop, and then start planing like so. If you're hand planing, 
and you've got a little bit of extra material down one end and the other to your line, which is what you're using, you can just concentrate with a few smaller strokes in that area till it looks even. And then continue to work all the way through. Just within a few minutes, we've sawn this piece to length and we've got our pieces ready to cut to length, ready for doing our rebates. Doing a project like that, you always want to keep your, your, even if it's just your scribbles or your plan handy, you always want to keep them handy so you know what your measurements are going to be while you're doing your project. Now in this case, I've got it all marked down here. It's going to be 185 millimeters wide, as I said before, 300 long, which means our long stretches are going to be the complete 300 because we're putting our rebates into those long stretches. So they will stay full length of the base piece. And then we're going to be taking a third of that 12 millimeters, which is going to be four millimeters in this case. So we're going to take four millimeters off both sides. The side pieces or the short sides are going to be fitting inside the long sides into those rebates. And we're making the rebate four millimeters, which is a third of that 12 mil material. Got to double that up, one for each side. So the side pieces have to end up being eight millimeters shorter than the full 185 width. Which it turns out in this case is 177 millimeters. Give or take a little bit. So now we've got our pieces ready, we can obviously move on to marking using our marking gauges for the rebates that we're going to be putting in the long stretches. So let's jump back down here, we'll mark them, talk you through that. And then I'll show you this hybrid approach that I use sometimes for doing rebates, which I didn't show you in the beginner video. So before we go ahead and decide which side our rebate's going on, we want to see which orientation we want our timber, if you want the grain to match and things like that. This is the orientation I'm going to use. And so I'm just going to put a one, a two, a two, a three, three, one, a four, so we know that it can only come back into this orientation now that we've marked it. In order to get the thickness for our 12 mil piece, we'll actually use our actual pieces that we've got here. If you're using one of these gauges, you can just drop it off the edge, lock it down, and you can see that they're sitting one on top of the other. And that's in case your bench is not flat. And that's exactly what we want it sitting flush just here now. On the end grain of these two pieces, mark it as deep as you can. And you want to just run it a little bit around here because we're only coming down four mil on this side. So you're just trying to mark about a third of your material on each side. I want to set this one to four millimeters now. Four millimeters is not a very big rebate. So once again, You've got to be pretty careful the way you do that. But if you've got one of these with a micro adjusting collar like this one is, you can really just get that as accurate as you like. You want to make sure you're referencing flat when you're doing this end grain part. So with this hybrid approach, we want to do what we normally do. So we're going to grab a chisel. Cut back to that line. Now you will notice that I've got this sitting on my bench hook and that's just to elevate it off my bench so I can saw it. So now I've created our little ridge here. <laughs> we can go straight in and saw down to our gauge line. 
trying not to go too far. Now the process is to come in with our chisel from this side. We just want to line it up, give it a little tap, and we're reading where the grain wants to split. Now if you've got fairly straight grain, this is a technique that's used traditionally for uh, doing tenon shoulders. But we can see that this is coming off very nicely. Now, you don't want to put much pressure on there with the hammer. It's just very, very light taps or you end up blowing your shoulder out, which you don't want to do. Slowly work your material down until you've got probably no, no more than two millimeters left above your line. Now what we can do Bring the chisel right into that line and we can hand pressure it through like so, getting the whole length all at once. Now we can see we've got a little bit of this fairy stuff just left here on the side of that shoulder. So with that I just bring my marking knife in along that shoulder and we clear it out. Now for the final referencing I like just a narrower chisel that's going to fit in here and we can just hold it flat going across the grain like so. And there we go, we have one rebate done. It should be relatively flat and reference well with your other piece. Which you can come in and check here and see how flush it sits along here. If it is a little bit out when it comes to the final referencing and stuff, you can actually come along here and just go on a slight angle along the back of the shoulder. And you're just undercutting this back edge to make sure that it sits flush here. Now it might be visible from the top when you do this, so you may or may not want to do this, but you're only doing a small amount to get a nice flat reference. So now obviously, we need to go through and repeat the rebate on these other three rebates. So we've brought them back together like this and there's always going to be a little bit of discrepancy when you do this, but little tiny gaps don't matter too much. You can see that it's a little bit wider here, and on this side I can still see partially my gauge line. Just shave a little bit off just the inside there. Same with this one. I'm just going to come straight back into that reference line that was there. Now when we bring this together, it should come together much better now. And we've got a much flatter fitment. We're going to go ahead and we're going to clamp this. And we're going to put a couple of nails in the side through here to hold this together. We're using nails, so it'll still have a little bit of movement in it, but we will clamp it. Grab a couple of whatever clamps you have that'll fit how wide this is. And we want to pull it together and lightly clamp it. So I'm lightly clamping there. And now I'm going to bring this side in and lightly clamp this side as well. I'm going to push them. In, make sure they're seated right up against the little shoulder here. Pull them together. Since my clamp fell off, I'm actually going to turn this around and put a nail in on the opposing top side here just to hold this. I'm just going to line it up and use my fingers here to feel for flush.
nylon again. And now what I want to do is actually flip it over and in effect the clamp off it's going to be a little bit easier. And we're going to get a nail in the opposing sides on this side doing the same process. Now these are springing apart so what I'm going to use the clamp I'm going to use it further down. You can see we've got that similar effect of the clamp further up but having the clamp down here it's just putting a little bit of pressure on these side stretches. Now once again a nail. Now I can take that clamp off and we can actually lay it this way so we have a little bit more support through the stretcher while we're working on it here. Now we can just go down to check that these ones are, are home. Now I can go ahead and put these other nails in. So while I was putting it together, I was just thinking and I've decided to change the design. Instead of having this big heavy piece of pine on the bottom, which is going to make this tray a lot heavier than I initially intended and just give it more bulk and weight than it really required. I'm now going to change, I'm now changed my mind and I've got some plywood sitting around here. So what we're going to do is place this tray on here. We'll trace out the plywood. We'll cut that out and we're just going to nail the plywood to the bottom of this particular tray. Line it up, try and get it as close as you can and then mark your lines where they may lay. Even if that is down on these thin edges that it doesn't quite hit. So what we'll do is these main lines here, I'll cut them out first. When you're cutting plywood, because you've always got some cross grain somewhere in your cut, it's advisable to use a cross cut saw at all times when doing that. And that is going to give you a much cleaner cut than using a rip cut. Now, if you're cutting off the line, hand planing back, maybe you don't have to as much, but with these plywoods, and this is red oak veneered plywood, and it's a very, very, thin veneer on the top and that is very susceptible to wanting to splinter because of how thin it is even though it is glued into the rest of the plywood substrate it is very prone to wanting to split so what I'm going to do is actually just cut it using the Japanese Ryoba and because it's got a really good cross cut tooth that's a very fine tooth it's going to cut this with quite little ease so in order to do this as you can see I've secured it off the edge of my uh, workbench here because I don't have a lot of space this is actually a good way for me to saw it and you've probably seen me do this before if you've been watching my channel for a while we have our line running just through here and the line is just about an inch off my workbench here and I'm just going to start by sawing just off that line And we can see, because of how fine the kerf is on this, and this strong cross-cut tooth here with a lot of teeth, we can see that it makes very, very quick work of cutting through plywood. Now you just want to do much shorter strokes when we get to the end here. So before we go ahead and obviously shoot the edge of this square back to the line, we want to make sure that this edge, the long grain essentially of this, just because it's in the longitudinal section of this plywood, we want to square that so it comes in square and flat. Once again, I'm going with this long grain sort of setup for this. It works well for plywood as well. So I've just got a wider board to support it. And we're just pushing it up against the bench hook, which works as a great stop here. Okay. 
I've put that edge we just squared up against the fence and that's what we'll use to fit these sides. What I like to do is bring this back in. We'll square it on here and see how well it's fitting. I can still see we have a little bit more to take off this edge. We've still got a couple of mils. So now the one last thing we need to do is actually go back and take a little bit more off this edge here. So to do that, I'm just going to use my normal shooting board since I've got it here and it fits. We'll reference it hard up against the stop here. Make sure our plane is referenced to where it normally is. And it's just a matter of keep on double checking until we get it right. So there we go. That's how we fit a plywood base to something like this where we're just going to flush mount it or butt joint it straight to the bottom. So let's go ahead and we'll nail this in place. So I've just evenly placed these and drilled a few holes around here so now we can go ahead and whack the nails in. I've just evenly spaced about five down each long side and uh, three across the short side. The numbers don't really matter. The only spots I can't drill my holes are where my hold fast are, so we'll tap these nails in and then come back and do those ones. So there you have it folks, there's a very basic tray that anyone can actually build and I think it was actually good that I decided to change the design of this to make this tray much lighter weight and easier to store things like your chisels and things like that in it. You didn't need that extra bulk in the design of this tray. I think that that just goes to show that even if you do have a plan, you've got to be prepared to, as you see things come together, you might have visualized it here, even put it in something like SketchUp and until you physically get it in your hands and start working with it, you might decide that you need to change your plan and don't be afraid to change it if you think it's for the better and it's going to make your project better. Definitely go try it out. Don't let your uh, your thought process get in the way of changing a design. Just because you've got it on paper, you've got it written down, it doesn't mean that you can't change it. It's not set in stone. Unless it's for something that's in the spec of a project that is for a client and it has to be a certain way. When you're designing things like this for yourself, this is just a little shop tray or it could be a drawer. You don't need to be that set in stone with your designs. And I think that this change that I made here actually improved this tray no end and it'll be way more useful because it wasn't as big and bulky with a, a big bulky base to it that it just simply didn't need. So if you like this video please consider liking and subscribing and don't forget to comment down below tell me how your day is going or what your last project was or how your beginner joints for woodworking are going please let me know down below that'd be great. And if you'd like to support me a little bit further, please consider giving maybe a super thanks to this video while you're down there below, or consider checking me out on Patreon. If you'd like to see some more videos, such as this great beginner video that we've done here today, please check out the video up here where I build this beginner butt jointed box, and also the pl beginner playlist that these videos are part of. Bye for now.